Hey everybody, we've got a great video for you today because I am standing next to an Ineos Grenadier and Adam, one of the first retail customers of the Ineos Grenadier in the country. And Adam's going on an epic road trip. He's already got 2,000 miles on his Grenadier and we're gonna talk about the realistic goods and bads of Grenadier ownership. So Adam, thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely, thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And first of all, let's talk about this Grenadier. What drew you to this vehicle? So I've owned, uh, I've had Nissan Frontier, Nissan Xterra, a big Nissan guy, right? Yeah. Um, but I've also owned a Land Rover Defender 90 that was imported from Spain, and I own a NAS Defender 110. Uh, and the Grenadier started coming out around the point where I was starting my NAS 110 restoration project, honestly. And I, and I found that they were building the vehicle that I was trying to build and restoring <laughs> my NAS. Uh, and, and another thing that I've realized in the... 20 plus year of being a car enthusiast is that no one ever does it better than a manufacturer, right? Like you can try to build a Porsche Cayman, but once you drive a Cayman, you, there's no turning back, right? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely perfect. So I wanted something that was fully integrated and I found that what Ineos was doing was really, really what I was looking for. Now let's talk about this company. So this was founded by um, basically a petrochemical billionaire in the UK and uh, you know, deliveries abroad started a little while ago. And I gotta be honest, I was really skeptical whether or not we'd actually see real Grenadiers in the States. And we have. We have. And I was glad to see them start those over there because for the American consumer, those are our beta testers. Those are the, the people who <laughs> yeah. are honestly doing the shakeout. So for a year in Australia and Africa and Europe, people have been driving this car and finding all the problems. And I feel like it's done us a pretty good service here in the U.S. Now, let's talk about how you got this one. Um, when did you pre-order? When did you order? And when did you take delivery? So I pre-ordered as soon as... The pre-order opened up that night. I think by like 8.30 that evening, I had submitted my $450 and I had a pre-order number. Uh, later on, and I guess, I don't know if it was a year or two later, I can't keep track anymore. <laughs> this year in May or June, they opened up the actual pre-order capability. So, so initially you have a reservation, then you had a pre-order this year. And that's like May, June of 23. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And so I spec'd it out. I spent a, I, I've spent a lot of time specking out Grenadiers, uh, and I kind of spec this out, spec'd out a couple of different versions, and then finally settled on this and submitted my my actual order with Ineos. Um, I think it's about an August manufacturer date okay. is when this was built. It arrived on the morning chant in Tacoma on the 12th of November, and then it was actually available for pickup at the dealer around the 18th of December. I was able to get out there on the 26th of December. Really cool door close sound on this Grenadier. Oh yeah, it's really, really fantastic. So this is a TFL slip test. We get various wheels stuck on purpose in these rollers to see the four wheel drive calibration and the traction control traction control calibration to see what Ineos and of course other manufacturers have done. But the procedure is the same across every car. So we back into the rollers. We put the vehicle into neutral to get it nice and settled into the slot, and then we put it in drive and slowly accelerate out. Like if you were stuck in the snow or in the mud, you would just jam on the throttle. Um, slow as possible, as fast as necessary, as one company once said. So this is a full-time four-wheel drive with a center differential, which means it's always in four-wheel drive, but there's a center differential lock if you want to lock the front and the rear drive shaft at the same speed, and also front and rear differential locks, which we'll play with in a second. So this is just going to be a rear wheel slip test, so both rear wheels are stuck, center diff unlocked like you're driving around every day. Let's see if we can get unstuck. Okay, very good. So not expecting a lot of drama there, and there was not a lot of drama there. Um, we just gave it a little bit of accelerator, a little bit of slip, front wheels engaged, and off we came. On to the next one. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about probably the most controversial part of the Grenadier right off the bat, which is the pricing. So um, what does it start at, and what does a model like this one spec out to be? Yeah, so I, I don't recall exactly what the bases are starting at. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that mine came in around 86, which okay. is not insignificant. That is a lot of money. It's the most I've ever spent on a car. Um, it's the most I hope to spend on a car for quite some time. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, I, I guess the, com the question then is, like, is it worth it? I think time will tell. I don't know that there's a decision that, that can, or, or an assertion that can be made yet. I think... When you buy a Grenadier, you're buying it with the hopes that this is a car that you're gonna be able to drive for a really long time. Mm. And so I think that the, the value is going to be 
expressed not in how it's been over these 2,000 miles, but how it is when it gets to 100,000 miles. Sure, that's interesting. Do you mind popping the hood? Yeah, Let's absolutely. talk about the engine. Now, one of the cool things that um, this gentleman did, which I think is really cool, is, Adam, you actually live on the East Coast, but you bought this out of Washington. Seattle, Washington. Seattle, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. is that just because you, you wanted to do a road trip? Is that the story? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to buy this, uh, when I looked at the map of where all the dealers were, yep. I wanted to buy it at the dealership that was as far away from home as possible. <laughs> And drive it home. And so my stepson and I flew out on uh, Christmas night, picked it up on the 26th, and uh, we've been driving it ever since. He had to start school today. Today's the first day of school. So he flew home yesterday, yesterday morning. Now, um, this obviously is, is an old school four-wheel drive vehicle, solid axle, body and yeah. frame, but the engine is provided by BMW. It's a B58. Uh, which is what you'd find in a lot of like three, four, five series products. What's your take on this engine so far? I think it's been wonderful. Um, you know, hearkening back to the original Defenders, uh, one of the most sort of famous Defenders that they made was in South Africa. They actually put a BMW straight six in a Defender and they're very, very rare, hmm. uh, but you can find those naturally, they're right hand drive. But those are very interesting to Defender collectors, right? Um, and so I love a straight six engine. I think it's absolutely smooth as can be. I also own a Disco 5, which has like the, I think it's the Lion uh, Ford V6 turbo diesel. Yeah. Um, I think I, th not a lot of similarities between the two. What I will say is that having driven that very torquey diesel engine for uh, 50,000 miles. I appreciate the torque and sort of power delivery of how they've tuned this engine. It's not the factory tune. Um, and I also think they've done some work in tuning it for longevity, which is again, sort of that value proposition to me. It's a really big deal. And, and power wise, like inline six turbos, they got enough oomph. I, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I think it's more than enough. It's not, um, it's not setting any records, but it, it gets out of its own way. It drives, it does, you know, I've, I've done 85, 88 on the highway, no problem. Gas mileage suffers because it's, yeah. it's got the aerodynamics of a brick uh, and weighs 6,000 pounds. But, so so yeah. I think they rated at 14 city, highway, and combined MPG. What have you been seeing? So I have uh, coming down out of Seattle uh, and across the Cascades, I was seeing close to 12. But that's up and down a lot of very big elevation changes. Uh, as I came through it started to get higher and higher. And I'd say that in the last day or two, I've probably been seeing about 15, but again, that's crossing over from Moab into Denver, right? So there's, right. there's a lot uh, over the Rockies. Mm -hmm. uh, I expect, and what I've seen on forums is that once I get to some of the flatter land, I should be seeing closer to 17, 18, maybe 19 miles a day. Next up, we have the diagonal slip test. So the right front and the left rear are stuck in the rollers. And the other two are gonna to have to start spinning if we're gonna get unstuck. And we're gonna start out normal mode, traction control on, sensor diff unlocked, like you drive it every day. This is your uh, your mom driving through the snow. Let's see how uh, how we get unstuck in this Ineos. So wheels are spinning. All right, a little bit of throttle. Um, felt maybe a little bit of traction control intervention, but it was like it was nothing. Um, there was really no drama whatsoever. Part of it, of course, is we do have a really grippy and a fairly large diameter tire, which certainly does help in the TFL slip test. This is a factory KO2 that came installed from the factory on the Ineos. We'll try it one more time. Yeah, okay. So, great result, no drama. Let's get to something harder. In terms of servicing this engine and, and the vehicle in general, um, it's got a BMW engine, it even says powered by BMW. It does. But all service is done through Enios, right? It's all at their facility. Well, for, for warranty service, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's, I, I wanna say maybe 18 dealerships around mm -hmm. the country. Not all of them are convenient. My, I, you know, I live near Washington, DC. My local's gonna be in Philadelphia. But as far as like oil changes and things like that, you can really take it anywhere. At 650, I stopped in to Boise and had them change the oil. Yeah. Uh, just as like that break in oil change. And they did a great job there. I was their first service customer. Uh, and from there on out for minor maintenance like that, I'll probably go to a local shop. Now, let's talk about the interior a little bit here. And first thing I noticed, the seat covers. These are super cool. What, yeah. What's the story with these guys? So these are Melville and Moon. Uh, they're a South African company. Uh, I have a set on my Defender 110. Uh, a lot of my friends with Defenders have had them. 
couple of things that I really like about them. I know this isn't about the, the seat covers ex expressly, um, but they add a lot of storage. One of the things that the Defend uh, Grenadier lacks uh, is really immediately accessible storage for the driver. The cup holders are small. You've got a little spot here. Mm. You got the cubby here. Having a couple of pockets in the back and these pockets on the side has really, really helped. Okay, that's a that's a good thing to know. Um, and and what about the technology? So one of the things that's been a little bit controversial about the Grenadier is there's no instrument cluster. It's all one central screen. Um, has that been pretty good to you? Has it been a little frustrating? I, I adapted to it very, very quickly. Um, the one thing that, that does throw me off is when I'm driving at night, I'm used to having a lot of light like right here. <laughs> yeah. And that's not there. Otherwise, it's been really, really good. One of the things that I like about driving a Defender is you can see that left front corner fender mm -hmm. as you're driving, which means when you're off-road, you know exactly where the front end of your vehicle is. You get that same feel in the Grenadier. And so I really, really like that. Keeping the low dash, I think it's helped. Um, people online have been complaining about things like, you know, the backup camera display isn't quite enough. And why don't they use the whole screen? Well, you have to remember that federal vehicle motor safety standards require you to have an odometer and a speedometer in the car at all times. So you can't just make the whole screen disappear because you're backing up. You have to know how fast you're going. What about like the tech in terms of phone integration, navigation? How, how does that work? Uh, so one happy surprise uh, was I had heard that there no, was no wireless uh, Android Auto, mm -hmm. but there is. It works. Oh, great. Um, very cool. So that's very cool. Of course, it has wireless Apple CarPlay. So largely... It's the same interface I would have in any other car with Android Auto. And then it's got some added stuff um, for off-road mode. It's nice because you can see like tire pressures and tire temperatures. You can see transfer case temperature, trans temperature, mm. all of those things. Um, so lots of good information. I, I think it's fine. I think it's very usable. Yeah. Any any glitches? Has it been pretty pretty solid? Yeah. No. One thing that people tend to, tend to cite online is that you'll get error messages that like... Uh, the, 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 the sign reading capability is not available or that this is not available or that. I think a lot of that is coming from dirty windshield. So it's, this car really has one camera uh, and that camera is used to recognize road signs and recognize for the auto emergency braking and blah, blah, blah. If that camera is obscured because of dirt or spray or whatever else, then it starts flashing error messages. So you clean the windshield, the error messages go away and you kind of keep going on. Now, um, speaking of that windshield, I did notice you picked up a couple, <laughs> couple little dings there on the, on the trip. Yeah, yeah. These seem to all be impact related, not stress related. I can find where, where you know, there have been rocks and things. And honestly, coming over the mountain passes in uh, Washington State, um, there were a lot of trucks, a lot of rocks, a lot of high speed. Uh, and so I think part of that's just going to be the nature of this very, very upright windshield. Right. All right, so in this test, only the right rear is on the ground. The other three are in the rollers. Once again, nothing's locked up. All right, okay. So gentle throttle application, got some traction control intervention, and we actually pulled off fairly quickly. I'm gonna reset the rollers, and we'll try it again in a different mode. What are your use cases for this vehicle? So you're, you're heading back to the, the, the DC area. Yep. yep. Um, is this gonna be your daily driver? Or is this this is be... my daily. Oh, yeah. okay. Very Absolutely. Cool. So this is largely gonna be occupied by my dog. Um, <laughs> he's gonna be the primary recipient of this space. And this is a, the dealership had this line around. They, they were like, cause I, I, they did, when I ordered it, I didn't order it with floor mats. Mm. And they're like, but may, let me go see if we have some floor mats. And they're like, well, this is all we have. You can put this in the back. But <laughs> they did have some in Boise. So I was able to get the rubber floor mats. Very cool. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think the storage is sufficient. Uh, I've taken a bunch out, sort of, you know, it's at the, it's at the hotel. Um, but I think, I think it's enough. Um, nice things that I like is you've got a 12 volt here. Yep. Which is nice. And then new for the US spec um, is you've got your power inverter oh, super there. Cool. Yeah, look at that. As well as in the center console, so that it's accessible by folks in the back seat. Right. Um, so that's handy. And then behind this panel is a jack, like a real hydraulic, real jack. Very cool. Um, so I thought about that nice. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, oh, I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I know like um, 
so um, I, I follow some, some of the UK channels. Like, Harry's Garage had a problem with the, the door access, with, like, mm-hmm. the little tiny door. Do you suspect you're going to have to open both doors often to get into the trunk, or is, is it... I think I don't think I don't think my dog is going to like jumping into this one with only this door open. I think he will like jumping out with only the door open. Okay, but I don't so think he'll like the whole yeah. thing up. Yeah, um, it's convenient. I you know I was in Boulder and I stopped at this. What is this place? The uh, Laughing Goat. Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So local they, coffee place. It's a good coffee. I picked up some coffee and when I was done, I just opened the little door and threw it back there. It and in it was there. good to go. So so it has that convenience level. Yeah. Um, you know I think obviously detractors are like you've got a lot of solid pillar here so the the rear view mm. is not wonderful interesting um but again i think i think the mirrors are appropriately sized they could be a little bit bigger uh but they seem to work all right so now we're in four high i've locked up the center differential and i've engaged the off-road mode up here on the ceiling and let's see if that has an impact on the performance on the rollers All right, okay, so not too much of an impact. We got a little bit more maybe intervention right off the right off the bat there. And now for this test, we're gonna lock up the rear diff, which is that button. Okay, it's thinking about it. It's not quite locked up yet. There we go, locked up drove right off. So very cool. So um, saw a little bit of a difference by going to off-road mode and a lot of a difference by going into low range. But we'll do one roller on the front and see what happens. So Adam, you've got quite the extensive list of history with four-wheel drives and off-road vehicles. Is this vehicle going to stay stock? What are the plans with this? We'll see. Um, You know, I definitely have I, th- I think like immediate things would be the Ibach, who is the OEM for the springs, has now a, a 30 mil lift kit. Oh, cool. Um, it's just a spring o- from the OEM that you install and replace. And I'd like to go up to maybe a full 33, but that's that's it. I'm not, I need to be able to get into parking garages and cities. Mm. Uh, and usually those are at max like seven feet. Uh, so I need to stay under that. Um, maybe a bumper with a winch in the future. It'll be interesting to see what the aftermarket does. I think that, you know, folks are expecting U.S. manufacturers to have stuff on day one. I I don't think that's a reasonable expectation. Most people have no idea what this vehicle is. Yeah. Um, What's what's like the response like when you're driving it around? There's there's definitely a lot of looks. And one of the things that I I really, really like about the Grenadier and what Enios has done here is that the the badging and the labeling is all very, very subtle. Hmm. So if you look at this car, there's like one very small Ineos badge here, yep. sort of a embossed Grenadier here, <laughs> yep. this logo that means nothing to anyone, <laughs> right? And, and that's about it. Like you've got no Ineos badge on this side and one on the back corner. Mm-hmm. So it's super subtle. People have no idea what this is. And so you do get some looks and, and some questions for sure. Final test. Only the right front is on the ground. And we're going to leave that front diff unlocked at first. Let's see if we can get unstuck with it unlocked. All right. Very, very good. So it took a lot of wheel spin, but um, center diff locked and we were able to get off with just the right front. So this vehicle has a lot of standard um, driver assistance technologies, um, and, and that can include stuff like it has lane keep, right? It, not is lane it keep, like it's a more, warning. It's more lane awareness. So as you're driving underneath the the speed sign, so it, it identifies the speed limit um, based on the camera, but also there's a database with the GPS that says, okay, you're on this road and this place. This is the speed limit. Right underneath that, there's these two little lines that'll show you either you're in the lane or you're out of the lane. So they'll either go like gray if it can't identify, green if you're in the lane, and red as you start to go over. But that's it. It's just a, hey, here's where you are. Okay. It's, there's no, none of the like resistive, you know, or, or where it'll drag a brake to keep you in the lane. There's nothing like that. And then it also is like a speed limit warning, right? Yeah. So the ADAS, again, it uses that database to identify where you are in the speed or, and or the camera. Um, and it will chirp maybe four times as you go over the speed limit. 
and then it's done. But if you go under and then you go over the speed limit again, it will chirp again. A lot of people find it super annoying. Uh, it's very, very easy to set a favorite. Like there's on the, where the center dial is, there's a button called favorite. And most everybody just sets the favorite to that page where you turn that off. Yeah, because the debate is every time you cycle the key, yes. that stuff comes back on, so you have That's to turn right. it off every time. That's right. And a lot of folks are upset about that. What's What's been your experience with it? I'll be honest, in cities, I actually kind of like it because okay. like I'm driving around Boulder, I have no idea what the speed limits are. I don't know if I should be doing 20 or if I should be doing 40 on these little local roads. So it's actually kind of handy. And I tend not to turn it off when I'm in cities or more crowded areas. When I get out on the highway, absolutely, I turn it off and it's good to go. Um, one other thing that I have noticed that, that I, I think needs a little bit of tuning is the auto stop start. So I have auto stop start on my Discovery 5 and it's very aware of when you turn the steering wheel. So it will start the engine when it sees a steering wheel input mm. because A, it uses the power for the steering. It also knows you're about to go somewhere. I think Ineos has a little bit of tuning to do with that because it, I, it's, it's very heavy steering without the engine on. Right, yeah. um, and so I do tend to turn the, the auto stop start off in the city because okay. that, I, I need responsive steering when I turn the wheel. So I have to say, um, Adam, one of the things I've, I've been surprised was just initially sitting in this vehicle. I haven't sit in any of the US production models, but the quality in here feels really nice. I was surprised. I, because I saw a lot of the pre-release vehicles and I wasn't sure what we were gonna get and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty surprised as well. Um, you like the button thing? You like having the yeah absolutely buttons? i mean i think honestly like for the hvac i set it to auto and i'm doing long distance driving so i set it to auto and i just kind of dial in the temperature a little warmer a little cooler if i get really too hot i'll just pop a safari window open and i'm good to go but Sweet. yeah it's pretty good these are a little bit of work to get used to okay and, and it's a little <laughs> fiddly um but i think Ultimately, it's you got to put them somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a bad spot for them. Man, overhead switches. There's nothing cooler. Yeah. All right, let's do it. So we'll just kind of put around here. So um, from a comfort standpoint, right? You've got yeah. 2,000 miles, a lot of highway use. I saw you stopped in Moab, which yep. is fantastic. Yeah, um, how how would you rate the comfort on this vehicle? I think it's great. What I'll say is that I do have the Safari window, so probably around 75, 80 miles an hour, you do pick up a bit of wind noise, um, but. You know, I think that's part of part of the compromise you make in having the Safari windows. I think if it was a fixed roof, there wouldn't be as much. I also have the snorkel or the raised air intake, so it probably wouldn't be as much with that without that either. Sure, right, right. Um, uh, and the seat comfort been pretty good. Yeah, it took me a little while to get my position dialed in. I think I like a, a pretty upright driving position. Uh, I keep my legs about at 90 degrees most of the time. I'm not a laid, you know, layout, lean back kind of driver. Right. So I was able to get that dialed in and it's been, it's been good. It's been pretty good. Yeah. Um, I like the visibility a lot too. It's kind of really big windows. It is great. You can see everything in every direction and you get a ton of light through the Safari windows. I, yeah, I'll, I'll question sort of heat as mm -hmm. we come into summer. Yeah. Cause um, there's no shade, right? It's just, no, okay. No, interesting. There's nothing. But I think people are, there will be an aftermarket solution. So if you had to like say your favorite thing about this vehicle so far, and your biggest frustration, and would you buy it again? What are those aspects? So I, it, you have a very commanding position on the road in this car. You sit really high, you see a lot. Um, I really like the driving position. It's been absolutely wonderful on and off road. So I think from a driving experience perspective, it's been absolutely wonderful. <sighs> Things that I don't like, it's pretty hard because I, I really do enjoy it. I, I think most of the things are really small kind of niggly things that I think will be resolved mm. in time. Um, I would like bigger side view mirrors. I think that would be very helpful because I do use my mirrors a lot. I would like the windshield to have not cracked. That would be really that would nice. be good. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think that's, that's about it. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, there have also been complaints about like the, the fuel gauge online. I think that's really related to people using like the, the, uh, what do they call it? Like distance to empty or they call it uh, remaining range mm. in the Grenadier. And I think that computer's learning how you drive and fuel economy and things like that. I think that's gonna become more accurate. I find the fuel gauge to be pretty good. I had it down to 21 and a half out of a 23 gallon tank. So it was pretty, like- Pretty down there. <laughs> it, was, it was not happy and telling me to, I was a little worried. Um, 
to fill up and, and it's been fine. Okay. So. There's a, a couple different trims of Grenadier. There's like the, uh, I always call it Trail Master, but it's Trial Master. <laughs> trial Master. Which is this trim. It's the very awkward oriented trim with the locking discs, steel wheels. And then there's the Field Master, which has got the alloy wheels and some other more comfort goodies. Yeah. Was that a decision for you you had to make? Like, which one am I gonna purchase? Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I went through the build and, and uh, kind of spec'd every version out to, to the level that I wanted. So for example, in the Field Master, you get carpet. In the Trial Master, you don't get carpet. Now you can order it with carpet. So I did, I ordered a Trial Master with carpet. And that was largely, because I think it helps quiet the car down a bit. Um, and so, yeah, as you kind of go through the configurator, you're making decisions like that. I'm trying to avoid your prairie oh, dog holes. You're, they're okay, they'll, <laughs> they'll, 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 they'll dump They're resilient? The yeah, <laughs> they're pretty, pretty good, strong going. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, You've owned now a couple of the classic Defenders. Yes. How would you say the driving experience compares to those those off-roaders? I mean, you can't compare. So a Defender, owning a Defender, it, you're basically driving a tractor. Like it's a street legal tractor. Right. Um, and it is probably the most analog and uh, enjoyable from that perspective driving experience that you'll have. But you do, I, I've never done a cross-country trip in a Defender. I don't know that I would want to. I, I certainly never dailied my Defender uh, because I had things like leaks because they're built on <laughs> 1950-era manufacturing processes that leak water. Right. Uh, I mean, there are... Land Rover publishes a Defender water mitigation handbook <laughs> all about how to keep your Defender from leaking. Uh, and, and so that, I think, long term just is untenable. This, on the other hand, is like buying a modern car made in a modern factory because that's exactly what it is. Right. And I think from that perspective, it's pretty great. So being that you're pretty plugged into the community, um, do you think this company is going to make it long term? You think they're going to stick around in the States? I certainly hope so. I mean, I think they are designing a dealer network and infrastructure to be sustainable. I think they have had to make decisions and make compromises. For example, we don't get the diesel. I really wish we had a diesel motor in this thing, but we don't get that. We're not going to. Yeah, well, right. well, why is that? <laughs> well, BMW wouldn't certify that uh, power plant package for the US for 10 years. And Ineos didn't want to pick it up if it wasn't going to be available for 10 years. They would certify the gas engine for 10 years. Certifying for emissions an engine in the United States is wildly expensive. They made the right decision and they decided to go with gas only. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they are making some very thoughtful decisions about what they're doing and how they're building this vehicle for the U.S. market. We're the number one market. The day reservations opened, the U.S. became the number one market for this vehicle. Yeah, well, I hope you're right. I hope I hope to see him succeed. Yeah. Well, Adam, I really appreciate you coming by. Um, guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, Adam is very active on the uh, the forums. If you want to get more of his info, are you going to keep this thing for a while? What's your plan with it? Uh, at least 10 years. I mean, wow, I, I, don't, wow. I, I don't see getting rid of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope I hope it's something that I'm able to, to really enjoy for a long time. Sweet. Well, thanks for coming on, dude. Yeah, I appreciate absolutely. it. Thanks for having me.